quietness to our heart now, a stillness so that we can hear your voice, open our ears to that. We would pray, as the song just said, you would lay a fire inside of our heart, that there would be a, a greater sense of passion for you and your kingdom and, and a vision for how we might be used by you. We are so grateful that your grace does abound to us. We need your grace. We're just so grateful for that. You know where everyone's heart is this morning, the difficulties, the storms they may have gone through, and so just bring, if not a calmness to the storm, a calmness to the child. Just help them be still to hear your voice this morning. And we ask that in our Savior's name. Amen. Been a good week. <clears throat> um, it's really a good week, busy week. Great to see you here this morning. I know the cold kept some people in bed, but glad you're here. We're going to talk about boldness this morning. Boldness is not a word that gets applied to very many Christians today. When it comes to sort of standing up for our faith, most of us would identify with the cowardly lying of the Wizard of Oz. We all just need a little bit of courage. Fear is listed as the number one reason why people aren't more vocal about their faith. And so I think we would all say uh, courage is a personal growth area. And one of the things that we see as we study through the book of Acts is that this, this concept of boldness or courage just marked the early church. Key word that runs throughout the book, you'll see a bit of that this morning. Uh, for example, the very final verse in the book of Acts, chapter 28. The screen credits are rolling, the music has crescendoed, the curtain is about to fall, and the very closing thought we are left with. He, Paul, proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Boldly going where no man has gone before. Yes, and and uh, the verse is intended to inspire the reader to the logical application point. We read that verse, it's just like glaring. Um, the application point is, okay, Christian, it's your turn now. Carry on the mission. Be bold in proclaiming Jesus. You're the next chapter in the storyline. And that's true. We are the next chapter in the storyline. The work of Jesus by His Spirit through His church continues. That's why I entitled this teaching series that we're in right now, Acts chapter 29. It reminds us of that. Uh, the work of Jesus by His Spirit through His church, through us, continues on. However, a society is becoming sort of increasingly resistant and reactive against Christianity, which makes the need for courage even more important. Uh, the purpose for our study is to consider why and how the church in Acts seems so irresistible and so unstoppable. There's my segue into Wednesday night. Uh, this Wednesday, 7, we're going to start just a short series. It's just six weeks long. It's an Andy Stanley video series. It's entitled Irresistible after a book that he has written. Um, I've read the book twice now. I've, I've found it very enlightening and, and stimulating because he's really, he's really asking, why is it that the, the millennial generation why there are so many people that identify as nuns, meaning no religious affiliation, not Christian, not Buddhist, not Jews, they're none. No religious affiliation. Why is that? Why was the church so irresistible in the book of Acts and so resistible today? Um, we need to have that, those sort of discussions. Um, so I think that study is going to be fascinating this Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Watch the video, we'll have some discussion. This morning we're going to focus on this character trait of boldness or on or courage. And we're going to be in chapter 4, we'll be there this week and this, next week. So let me set the context for the story. 
God has just healed a man through Peter, a man who had been crippled from birth. Uh, this man survived uh, by, by begging and pleading for money from those who had passed by him as he sat at the entrance to the temple. And so he, he's healed, and he begins bouncing around like Tigger in, the, in, in Winnie the Pooh. Uh, and the excitement gathers a crowd, Peter takes advantage of that and begins to share the good news with the, the crowd that has gathered. That's chapter 3. We pick it up. Chapter 4. The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. We don't have the exact timeline, but we're perhaps just, just a few weeks out from Acts chapter 2, the opening verse, the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of uh, the, the Spirit of God upon the people, this new covenant that, that began in the old covenant, this, the Spirit came and left people, but now the Spirit takes up permanent residence in the believer's life. Acts chapter 2, 120 people waiting for the outpouring of the Spirit. Peter preaches, 3,000 people believe the phenomenal event, Acts chapter 2. The church has grown now. It says there are 5,000. And being a very patriarchal society, they were counting just the men, you noticed in the text. And so the church is larger than that, but incredible expansion in the number of Jesus' followers. But we also see now, at least for the first time, it's recorded in the book of Acts, this opposition, this persecution of the church. Peter and John, they're seized and put in jail. Verse 5. The next day the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest. And if you know the gospel story, when you hear the word Annas, you're going, boo, boo. Okay, Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas. Boo, boo. John, Alexander, and the others of the high priest family, they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Luke doesn't use the word, but what he is describing is a meeting of the Sanhedrin. Uh, that was a council that consisted of 70 members plus the high priest. Uh, they were, in a sense, both the Supreme Court and the Senate of the nation uh, of Israel. And, uh, and we miss the emotional tenor of, of, of the text if we don't understand the connection of Ananias and, and uh, Annas, I should say, and Caiaphas. They played a very prominent role in condemning Jesus to the cross. And so you imagine the scene. 71 just cold-eyed, scowling, stern rabbis seated in their customary semicircle. John and Peter are brought before them. Memories of the trial of Jesus had to be flooding their mind. Was history going to repeat itself? Uh, were they going to suffer the same fate? Would they be handed over to the Romans to be crucified? Uh, they could hardly expect justice from this court. And so you would expect Peter and John just to be shaking in their sandals right now. They have to be overcome with fear. Next verse. And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel 
It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mankind by which we must be saved. Condense the sermon down. You killed him. You rejected him. God raised him. Repent. Now, if you or I were standing alongside Peter, we would be whispering, chill out, Pete. Don't you know who these dudes are? Shut up, man. We're too young to die. You're not being courageous. You're being crazy. And it's true, verse 13. And when they saw, when the Sanhedrin saw the courage of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. That is such a powerful and rich verse right there. We're going to pause there for a bit. When they saw the courage. I traced the word courage. Um, sometimes it's translated boldness, but traced it through the book of Acts. Um, words always have very shades, nuances of meaning. But one of the clear nuances of meaning in the word uh, courage is fearlessness of speech. Fearlessness of speech. When they saw the fearlessness of speech of Peter and John. And I just want you to see that. The, the, that sense flows through the book of Acts. Um, a couple of examples of that. That sense, we'll just read them. Chapter 9. Paul preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus, speaking boldly in the name of Jesus. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him, which magnifies how bold and courageous he was. Uh, chapter 13. When the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. Chapter 19. Paul spoke boldly, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God, but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. That's what the church was referred to, the way. So courage in the face of opposition, fearless speech in the face of opposition, that's behind this word. Back to chapter 4. So the, the Sanhedrin, it says they were astonished by the fearlessness of speech because, well, these were just unschooled, ordinary men. That is, they, they were uneducated. They hadn't gone into any, any formal rabbinical sort of uh, study or background. They were fishermen. They were common people. Uh, NIV says ordinary people. Some translations say common people. Actually, the Greek word is idiotai. We get a word idiot from it didn't actually have that sense in the Greek language. But the word does reveal just how spiritually smug the Sanhedrin were. They were here. They were the educated ones. You were the simple, common, untrained guys. But they're so fearless in speaking. And then this flash of insight. I love this, this phrase. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. You know, you can tell when someone's been hanging around Jesus. You really can. There's something different about their character. Something about their courage. I found this slide. Just a little tangent, a little break in thought. Be bold or italic. Never be regular. Um, yes, uh, in observing your character and your actions, would anyone say, 
Seriously. I can see you've been with Jesus. You've been hanging around him. Bold like Jesus. Verse 14. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could do. Yeah, that's pretty powerful supporting evidence. Remember uh, visual aid speeches back in high school? You do your speech with a visual aid. Well, Peter and John have the ultimate visual aid. This guy was 40 years old, had never walked a day in his life. Everyone knew that, who, who went to the temple, and here he is now. Richard Simmons on Adderall, walking and leaping and praising God. Verse 15. And so the Sanhedrin ordered them to withdraw and then confer together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot <coughs> deny it. Amazing. That just they cannot, we cannot deny it. But they were so spiritually dark and so hardened in their own beliefs, even with undeniable evidence standing right in front of them, they wouldn't believe. Verse 17. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Verse 18, and then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach it all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Very important phrase right at the end of that verse. We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And I was thinking about this and here, here's sort of my conclusion statement out of it. Courage. We want courage. Courage is the byproduct of confidence. So let me explain what I mean. Uh, therapy hats on, as I always do, our beliefs inform our emotions, our emotions put us in motion and produce a behavior. Trace it backwards. What's the behavior? Fearlessness of speech. What's the emotion that put them in motion and produced fearlessness of speech? Well, this is this courage, this lack of fear, this confidence. Where does that come from? It comes from our beliefs. Our beliefs always determine our behavior. Okay, what's the belief? The resurrection of Jesus is irrefutable proof that verifies everything that he said and who he claimed to be. It is that confidence, that assurance of belief that produced this behavior of being fearless and speaking. So I wish Wendy was here today because I get so much, I call it Wendy Wisdom. Wendy Wisdom from, uh, from him, <coughs> next, next slide. This is something he posted on Facebook. Um, here we go. The problem with the world is intelligent people are filled with doubt, while stupid people are filled with confidence. You gotta know Wendy because that is so Wendy right there. Um, and I laughed when I read it and then I began to think about it. Well, wait a minute. Doubts are not wrong. Doubts are not bad. Um, doubt is just the questioning mind. It's the exploring mind. Intelligent people have doubts. That's not the problem. Most stupid people filled with confidence, yeah, that can be a problem. Confidence, that is, without any confirming or any supporting evidence, that's the problem. And, we meet people like that, claiming to be wise, they've actually become fools. In the Christian faith, though, the behavior comes from a belief, and that belief is based on this confident assurance, based upon the fact Christ rose from the dead. That's why we see Peter and John being so 
bold in their speech. You can't uh, imitate or, uh, that behavior in our life until we have that same sort of conviction in our beliefs. That's the point. Peter's courage was based upon that confident belief. Verse 13 again, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. What we have seen and what we have heard. Again, that, that phrase is so important. The Christian faith is built upon, based upon, eyewitness testimony of an event in history, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Evidence that was so compelling, so convincing to that, to that early church that it filled people with a confidence that they could not help but speak and speak fearlessly and boldly. They even gave their lives while proclaiming it and no one dies. A cruel martyr's death if their belief system over here is shaky or they think it's a myth or maybe it's not true. You see that? That is so important. Um, that is why, and I already highlighted this verse in the, um, this series, but John, Peter's partner in this scene, later wrote this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. No doubt, resurrection appearances in John's mind there. We proclaim to you behavior. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard which which formed our convictions. We, we are without a doubt. This is what we believe. Therefore, here's the behavior. And so the skeptic, the opponent of Christianity, the antagonist wants to talk about oh, some scientific theory that they believe discredits the Bible. Or they want to talk about the hypocrisy that's in the church what they don't want to talk about is the Christian faith is based upon eyewitness testimony of an event in history. Christianity rises or falls on a historic question. And the question is, did Jesus rise from the dead? Because if he didn't rise um, from the dead, as Paul says, our faith is futile. Um, Christianity doesn't rise or fall on the performance of, of, of Christians. It, it doesn't rise or fall on, on some scientific theory versus perhaps what the Bible says, and we're trying to interpret it, what it means. It rises or falls upon the resurrection. And with that truth proclaimed to the Sanhedrin, and with the supporting evidence of this healed man standing in front of them, verse 14 says, there was nothing they could say. The Sanhedrin had no response. So again, confidence in the resurrection gave Peter and John great courage. Now the passage we, um, as we read it, perhaps gives us this impression that Peter had this in-your-face attitude when he spoke. That's what boldness means. In your face. Um, and I think that gives us an unbalanced definition of what boldness is. Again, words get their meaning from their context. and Words have different nuances of, of meaning. Uh, here's one more verse that gives us a different nuance for what boldness means. John chapter 10. The Jews who were there gathered around him, Jesus, saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And you've guessed already, the word plainly, same Greek word, same word in the Greek language, as the word we're studying, boldness. And so 
I've been saying boldness means fearlessness of speech, but here it's a, it means, let me say, frankness of speech. Fearlessness of speech, frankness of speech. Tell me plainly. Don't, don't, don't be around the bush. Just straightforward. Get to the heart of the matter. Be, be direct. Don't be sidetracked. That, that's what I, how I want to express it. Because I think the case for Christ, I think the case for Christianity um, would be better served if we would just be, just be more straightforward um, in our message. Don't go down those tangent bunny trails. Christian faith is built upon a historical event. The resurrection of Jesus and, and all the implications of what that means. If he was risen from the dead, what he said was true. When he claimed uh, to be the Lord of our lives, we need to make him the Lord of our lives. Well, when he's risen from the dead, he, he suddenly got an awful lot of credibility when he makes those sort of truth claims upon our lives. So just keep the message to that. <sighs> Let me try to wrap it up. Um, and then I, I want to respond if you have questions. Because we're, we're back to why we're doing this study. Because I think the millennial generation, that, that sort of growing generation of nuns, uh, those who don't claim any re religious affiliation, I think they perceive the church uh, like the Sanhedrin. They think of the church <coughs> as this, uh, this stern, rule-oriented, cold-eyed judges. Um, that, and that's not helpful. And then I think they, and this is sort of the ironic twist of it, I think they, they view individual Christians like the Sanhedrin viewed the disciples, those uneducated, unenlightened, simple-minded people. Yeah, and there is some irony in that, but um, I want to use Peter's words to sort of, I think, wrap my conclusion all into this. So Peter said this, Always be prepared to give an answer. It doesn't say give an argument. It just says give an answer. To everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. The reason for our hope is that there was an event in history that changed the world, the resurrection of Jesus. Skeptics have denied it. Antagonists have argued against it. But no one can explain the missing body. No one produced the body. Um, uh, no one can explain away all the eyewitnesses, testimonies of the resurrection. No one can, can explain the dramatic change in these cowardly disciples who became so bold in their testimony. Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect. Don't get into someone's face. Just give a plain, straightforward answer. The most plausible explanation is Jesus rose from the dead, as he claimed. Um, how else do you explain all the eyewitnesses? How else do you explain the fact that the Roman government and the, and the Jewish religious establishment, who would have done anything to discredit that and disprove that, didn't? Um, so, so important. How do we become irresistible to a generation that has turned away well, number one, here's the conclusion. Stay on topic. The Christian faith is about Jesus and the resurrection. And number two, back from the text, verse 13, be a reflection of Jesus. They, the Sanhedrin, took note that these men had been with Jesus. Such a powerful phrase. Why did the church grow? Well, one of the reasons was this church, as I said last time, was so counter to the culture. They loved one another. They cared for one another. Why did they do that? Because when you understand vertical grace, you extend it horizontally. And there was this church that loved one another 
and stayed on, on message. We have a risen Savior. That's the explanation. Good stuff, huh? Any questions? Walking and leaping and praising God. Okay, let's pray together. Worship team, come on back up here. Nice and loud, Ed. You know, journalists, they have sources and to get story. Eyewitnesses. They're eyewitnesses. And they can become anonymous. So they write a story, and they always have something to back it up because they, got, they have um, witnesses, right? But anyway, so the Bible is written by what you say, eyewitnesses. Well, in my life, I've heard non-believers say, well, the Bible was written by people like us. <laughs> And we can't go back to those eyewitnesses to prove that it was written by Paul, John, Luke, you know. So that's where I sit with some of my friends that are non-believers. We can't confirm it with the eyewitnesses. Um, okay, I hear what you're saying. And, and actually, I like your, your word picture there. Fake news today with all their anonymous sources. Well, our sources are not anonymous. Um, um, but they claim to be eyewitnesses. And the number of eyewitnesses was so significant. And again, there were forces of opposition who could have easily discredited them. They could have said, Jesus rose from the dead. Wait a minute, guys, let's take a field trip. Right, here's the tomb, roll the stone away, there's the body. Um, and books have been written about this. Books written by um, antagonists and skeptics to the faith. Frank Morrison, Who Moves the Stone? Great example. Um, actually, Simon Greenleaf, I think of the Greenleaf Law School, Another person who started out as an atheist, his goal in life was to discredit Christianity, and in the process of trying to do that, the, the evidence was so overwhelming that he became a believer. Josh McDowell, his two volumes, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, followed the same course of line. And so, when people will say there's no evidence, just say um, there's actually overwhelming evidence. But stay on task, because the question is about the resurrection. And on top of that, how do you explain the dramatic change that took place? Again, people do not die for a lie. They do not give up their, their, their lives for something they don't believe in. This dramatic change in the disciples was because their beliefs, they were so confident, so assured of the resurrection of Jesus. Sounds like an Easter message, but every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Let's stand. Here's our application song for the day. And, uh, well, I want to hear you say.